One of the questions I get asked at shows probably more than any other is I'm going on a new lake, where do I start? And whilst it's very difficult to answer that question at a show, what I hope to do over the next few sessions is show you how I fish a new lake. This 45 acre pit behind me is in Broome in Bedfordshire. I've been here a couple of times before. I've got limited information about what's swimming around in here. So I really am starting from scratch. The first bit of advice I can give you is let the carp tell you where to fish. You know, people think there's a magic answer with tackle and bait that means you're suddenly gonna start catching them. That is simply not true. You've got to get there early. You've got to do laps of the lake until you actually find them. This place is an open lake. It's really affected by the wind. The fish are quite young and they're not really affected that much by angling pressure. So they move around a hell of a lot and often they're on the wind, but not today. We've got a northerly wind blowing. It's very, very cold. And on my laps around the lake, I saw from the other side of the lake, I saw a fish show off at this point and then it showed again. So that is the obvious place to start. Always try and get there early if you can. They're gonna show in the first couple of hours of daylight if they show at all. If you turn up at one o'clock in the afternoon, you're just walking around with really nothing to go at. So my first tip is get there at first light. When I first arrive at a new venue, it's fish activity that really dictates how I should fish. So if all the fish are in a quiet bay and they're showing, there's heads coming out one after the other, then I'll literally plop three rods out, really light leads on, helicopter rig so you can fish over any kind of lake bed with a pop-up on and see if I can get a quick bite. If the fish are out in open water, maybe they're not showing that much, I've had the odd sign, then I'll perhaps try and find an area out in open water near where I've seen the fish establish a bit of a baited area, but still be prepared to move if that doesn't spark up. So in this situation, I've cast around with a marker float and then with a bare lead just to make sure the area is clean enough. I put 20 spawns of bait out, that's crumbed up boily and sweet corn, two brilliant baits for this time of the year. I'm using corn in my mix in this session because I know there's hardly any nuisance fish in this lake. There's no real bream, uh, there's a few tench, but they're not really a problem. Carp absolutely love corn. And if you're trying to go on somewhere new and get a feeding response out of fish you don't know a lot about, if you can get away with corn, it is a massive edge. I'm mixing it with crumb boily, just crushing that up in the crusher. Again, there's not a fish swimming that won't eat crumb boily. You put the two together, it gives a nice carpet on the bottom. There's a bit of Canadian pond weed out there, so some of it will disappear into the weed, some of it will sit on top. And um, you know, it's a brilliant combination for this time of the year. I've started the session with 20 medium spoms and you would think it would take quite a long time to get my first bite, but to counteract that I'm fishing three higher track pop-ups over the top of it. And what I've found in the past is, once you put out bits and pieces you can attract the fish in and if you've got something bright sitting over the top like the cherry on top of the cake, you can get a bite before they've eaten any of the loose feed at all. So just because I put that amount of bait out doesn't mean to say I wouldn't get a quick bite. Well that didn't take long, uh, about an hour after putting the bait in and the left hand rod is away. Uh, got the old red baron up there <laughs> doing loops and loops behind us. I didn't think I was going to get a bite as quickly as this to be perfectly honest but it just shows you how the fish are responding to bait uh, this time of the year. The water's well above 10 degrees now. It's a mirror. I'm just using past experiences. The fish responded to bait on the, on the previous session. Daytime is such a good time in the spring for a bite. The fish are so temperature controlled at this time of the year. And as the water's warming up, they're starting to feed. As I've got that bite, um, the fish has charged across in front of the other rods and picked up one of the other lines. So what I've done is just loose, undone the bail arm taking the line out the buzzer so it's not constantly going off. Having that slack line just enables me to get the fish in without problem. You can easily pull the hook out if you've got another line attached. So it's a good little tip if you're fishing on your own, you pick up one of your other lines, just open the bail arm, hopefully you'll be able to play it in, untangle the line once the fish is in the net. Come on, in you come. Get in that net. Bosh, got him, wicked. I always leave the fish in the net and get the rod back out as quickly as possible because you never know how long the feeding spell is going to last. It was definitely the right thing to do as the second bite came only minutes after the recast on exactly the same rod as the first. I didn't rebait after the first bite and I think this definitely helped the second bite happen even faster. 
The skill is reading the situation on each session and then deciding if more bait's needed or not. What a way to start. 17 pounder, absolute stunner. The other one was 14 and it just goes to show you put the effort in first thing in the morning, find the fish and you can make a big lake like this seem pretty small. Proof of the pudding, they are responding to the bait. The faster you notice patterns emerging on your lake, the quicker you're going to be onto the fish as they move around. And what I've noticed here so far, I think because it's shallow, you get action really quickly. Find the fish first of all, get on them, get out reasonably quietly, put a bit of bait out maybe. I've had a couple of bites really quickly on the last couple of sessions and then it's gone dead. And then the fish have turned up in a completely different area, nowhere near where they should be. And I think they've moved off the angling pressure. So it's worth really thinking about why you're not getting action as much as why are you getting action. Now it's getting later in the day. I haven't seen anything out in front of me. I've been watching like a hawk all afternoon. I haven't seen anything in front of me. So it's probably time to bring the rods in, go up to the other end of the lake where I've seen them before and just see if they've moved up there quietly and if they're happy up there showing and stuff and then I can move on to them and maybe nick another bite. The major advantage of fishing off the barrow is that you can move so quickly. If the first thing up is your bivvy, then you're sort of welded to that swim and if fish start showing elsewhere, you're probably not gonna move. But doing what I've done today and just having everything on top of the barrow ready to go means that if they do start showing elsewhere and at this time of the year, the fish are highly nomadic, it means you can chase them around and get on them straight away. I decided not to fish that night, so my rods were ready to go at first light. If I'd had rods in the water, maybe over bait, I'd be less inclined to wind in and cast at a showing fish. This way meant that I made the absolute most of every show, and when bites are hard to come by, it can be the difference between a blank and a fish in the net. The left rod went short where I'd seen the fish the evening before, and the other two went long after seeing a fish just after first light, which is the best time to spot them. It's really important to carry a different range of lead sizes because you never know the fishing you're going to be doing, especially on a new water. I can be dinking it out like 20 yards amongst loads of fish in shallow water or whacking it out, you know, 120, 130 to fish showing out in the middle. And, and having the heli safe on makes the whole thing so versatile. You can take the lead on and off so easily. And it just means that you can get out a distance if you want to or be really quiet in the corners at the same time. Been out there about an hour now. Pretty bleak conditions today, um, and not a lot of fish activity as a result. One of the rods luzzed out, probably 110, and I'm wading out at least 10, has produced the first action from this end of the lake. It just shows you how important it is to keep your eyes peeled and uh, put rods where the fish are. Bosh, got him. 16 and a half pound fighting machine. I've just left him in the sling for a little while just to recover. It's a good idea to do that when you've had an epic battle. Just let them recover a bit in the sling and then let them go. Um, and while this fish has been waiting, I've seen a fish show behind me on that bank where the wind's blowing into, which is no surprise. The fish on these big pits do seem to follow the wind, you know, really quickly. Even though I've had a bite out of this swim, it's time to move and make the most of the last few hours. As usual, the gear stayed in the car when I got here at first light this morning. Did a circuit around the lake, saw three fish in completely different areas of the lake, all off the back of the wind, but most importantly, one was off the point that we call Hippo's Point now, that I started fishing at the beginning of the last session where you saw me. And what's happened in between times, I've been back twice more. One time it was 
bitterly cold, even though it was well into spring, we had minus temperatures at night, everything was frozen solid. I chased the fish around for two days, managed to scratch one fish on a single right up the other end. And then last time I came, the weather had improved dramatically. And again, the fish showed off that point, but more on this side of the lake where we are now. Started off just fishing singles, and then basically put some bait out to where I thought the wind was going to be blowing. It was a slow start, but it just got better and better. And for the first time, the fish really responded to the bait. And I think I had, I had four takes in the first couple of days. And then on the final morning, I had 12 bites. I managed to snare 330s in that session as well, which was amazing. Uh, one I had to photograph on the map because my camera had run out of battery and it really came alive and the fish really responded to the bait. So even though I haven't seen fish in front of this, this swim. This is where I finished the last session. I'm fishing at exactly the same range, so it's 80 yards off the bank. I'm wading out um, basically four rod lengths, so it's 16 rod lengths I'm casting from here. It's just pretty nondescript out there, pretty flat. There's a little bit of weed coming up in places, but the, the, it's fishable pretty much everywhere because I'm using that helicopter rig with a hook link sliding up, so it comes to rest on top of whatever's out there. And I've started off with bait again because in the past, chasing fish around has produced bites, you know, and it's, it's a very labour intensive kind of fishing, um, but I've not really built any sort of hit. And that last session, you know, the fish really responded to the bait, wading out, putting more bait out with the throwing stick, and the bites are coming an hour later, and it just built and built. And uh, unfortunately, I ran out of time, I had to come home. With the wind blowing this way, it's another northerly that's sort of northeasterly at the moment, the same as it was last time I was here. It's still really cold for the time of year, but I would imagine, although they've showed off that point first thing this morning, they tend to move on the wind, especially as the, the day warms up. And of course in the spring it's getting warmer and warmer all the time and they end up out in front of here. So I've set my stall out, put a bit of bait out, put three rods out of that same range, two at 16, one at 17 rod lengths. The furthest rod is the one most downwind, so basically the other two rods are shorter so that that rod can pick up fish as well, the other rod's not cutting it off. I've sprayed a couple of hundred baits over the top of it, three little Mystic Spice pop-ups. That's how we're going to start and if we see fish showing elsewhere, obviously I'll move on to them. When going on to a new venue, I recommend you stick with a bait that you've caught loads of fish on before. In this situation, I'm using a prototype bait that I've used for the last couple of years. It's a new one by Mainline. Basically, it's suited to cold water, but fishes really well all through the year. Worst thing you can do is go onto a new lake with a new bait, never caught a fish on it before, and when you're not catching, then the doubts start coming in. Is it the bait? Is it the spot? Is it the rig? So when you're starting on somewhere new, go in with complete confidence. Yes, Come on, get in that net, get in that net. Boss, got him! Even though I've had a bite, it's still sharp, so I'm not going to change it. Um, beauty of this rig is I can put another bait on really easily. Get it back out there again. I've just transferred the fish into the sling in the water. That will stay out there until I get the rod back in position. Won't put any more bait out for the time being. There's enough out there to get another bite. But it's all about now getting the rod back out onto the spot as quickly as you possibly can with minimum disturbance. There he is. Rod's back out on the money. This one goes 20 pound on the button. Really good to get off the mark quickly. And uh, it looks good for more. The wind's still pumping in here. Not seen any fish show, but this is all the indication I need that they are in this area. Certain waters definitely suit certain kinds of bait application. I've tried spawning on here. Um, crumb boily and corn, you know, brilliant combination, especially in the early spring. And I've caught over it and caught quickly, but I've not managed to build a hit of fish. And I've often found that after a couple of quick bites, the fish have moved off to another part of the lake, sometimes against the wind. And it just felt like I wasn't getting it dead right. In the last session, the fish really responded to the same bait, the new bait from Mainline, the fibrous winter bait. You know, they were definitely liking that bait, but I was applying it with a throwing stick rather than the spawn. And uh, it seemed like the results got better and better. Being able to wade out like 20 yards 
and throwing stick the baits out. I'm only having to go sort of 65, 70 yards then. I can get four or five baits in the easy stick at one time. Basically leaning into them because I'm out in the water and there's a tendency to sky the baits where you're trying to avoid hitting the water with a stick. So you notice my body is actually leaning forwards and I'm trying to throw them forwards as well as up and that's keeping them quite low against the wind and stopping them sort of coming back in my face. Regarding amounts of bait, well that's really dictated by how many fish are in the lake. So this is pretty unknown this one. I would say at least 100 fish, uh, maybe as many as 150. You know, I've been putting out probably a kilo at the start and then another 100 or so baits after each two or three fish. But bear in mind in a shallow lake like this, the bait makes as much disturbance as a cast and sometimes it's better to wait and see if you can get two or three bites over a big spread of bait, which is what the throwing stick creates, rather than putting bait out after every single fish. And uh, also the time of year can make a big difference. So, you know, when the fish have spawned and they're really hungry, you know, the height of summer when the water's warm, if conditions are good, there's a good blow on, you can get away with loads of Bait. Springtime, it's blowing a northerly, you know, it's, it's not brilliant weather conditions and as a result you just need to hang back on the bait because you can definitely put too much in. So it's also worth keeping an eye on the birds. If you've got ducks diving in your swim they're picking loads of baits up, it's obviously still there. There's no need to put more in. If you're getting loads of takes and the takes dry up, maybe it's time to add a bit more. So it's a case of reading the situation, using the stock of fish to dictate how much you use and choosing a baiting approach that suits the water that you're on. Completely out of the blue, another bite. Ooh, ducks just flying over the top of the line there. Just praying this one don't come off. I had a, I had a bite pretty soon after that early bite and uh, there was loads of weed on the line and the fish just came off. When you've lost one, the next one you really need to get in. Come on, big fella, in you come. Yes, get in! Yeah! What a pristine fish. 26 and a half pound, big thick wrist of the tail, shoulders on him as well. I'm sure it'll be really big one day. And I've uh, got the rod back out on the spot already while well, this one was in the sling and um, no bait is going out and that is absolutely key at the moment. I put bait out after losing the fish earlier on and nothing happened until this one came along sort of five or six hours later and it's been all daytime bites so I reckon I've probably scared the fish away in the middle of the day. So three rods are back out again, no baits going in the swim and we'll see if we can nick a few more bites on those rods before it gets dark. The curve shank hook basically comes from a fly hook that my fishing mates and I were using probably about 20 years ago now and the reason we liked it was because it had a straight point and a really aggressively curved shank and an interned eye. The problem at the time they were bronze because they were fly hooks, they had a round cross section so they weren't flat folds which basically means they're squashed on two faces and I like that because I think it stops the hook from twisting inside its own hole, basically it butts up against the flat edge and I think it stays put better. So when we brought them out, obviously we made them flat forged and we kept the shape almost exactly the same. We improved the point, made the barb even smaller than it was already on the fly hooks and obviously, you know, gave them a very low reflective finish, which is very, very smooth, a PTFE finish, which penetrates really easily. The situations I use them in will pretty much anywhere, to be honest. The spinner rig that I've been using over the last sort of 12 to 24 months suits it perfectly. And the hook sits so well in that situation. It sits up pretty much upright, but it's just cocked over like a claw, ready to grab the flesh. And I, normally I use a size four with probably a 14 mil pop-up in that situation. I've used it on various other pop-up rigs as well. You know, if you're just using a coated hook link and you strip a bit away near the hook and just have a soft hair, that's worked really well for me with a little tiny bit of shrink tube just off the eye of the hook to flip it over and help it catch hold. And then when fishing with bottom baits, I tend to use it either with IQ straight through and the IQD rig really centers around that hook. And then if it's really snaggy, I move over to materials like the uh, hybrid stiff, which is much more robust 
um, because it's got a braided core. I fished that D-Rig style again, tie my favourite whipping knot onto the hook first, then a tiny little swivel goes on a micro rig swivel, and then you're simply tying the knotless knot, making sure you go out the eye of the hook on the point side, that is so important, that helps the hook flip over and catch hold. And more recently, rather than using shrink tube to finish it off and help it catch hold even more, I've gone on to using the kickers, and obviously I use the one that slides most easily over the eye of the hook. So I use size twos a lot of the time when I'm fishing with slow sinking bottom baits. I like a big hook, I think it snags faster in the fish's mouth, and the big hooks nowadays are still so sharp, there's no real disadvantage to using them. And I think they don't know it's a big hook until it's actually in their mouth. And then with pop-ups, I tend to use one slightly smaller, but still probably on the large side of the spectrum. So a size four most of the time. And again, because it's hidden underneath the bait where it's popped up, I don't think it's as visible to the fish. And if they're seeing the pop-up before they're seeing the hook, you know, you're snaring them. So the situations I probably wouldn't use a curve shank in, if it's hellishly snaggy or hellishly weedy, I wouldn't use the standard curve shanks. There I might go up to the curve shank double X, but for me personally, I like to beaked pointed hook in that situation. So probably a wide gape X would be the one I'd go to. But for most other situations, I would use a curve shank as my first choice. The wind completely died overnight and no bites came. The weatherman said it was gonna blow up the other end today and that was enough motivation to pack up and get ahead of them. Approaching a new water is always exciting. I really enjoy the learning process and the getting to the point where you know you can catch every single time you go. And you know, the lead up to that point is so, so interesting. The, the learning curve is so steep. And to be honest, when I get to a point where I think, you know, I'm gonna catch one, I know I'm gonna cast at that tree at that distance and I'm gonna get a bite, then really the magic's gone for me and I'm sort of going through the motions. So. You know, that, that building a picture of how the lake lives and breathes, you know, where the fish show on certain conditions and, uh, you know, sort of second guessing them and getting ahead of them, you know, that's, that's a real massive buzz for me. See, there's, there's probably phew, must be ten or twelve decent fish just, just out slightly further. But I suspect they'll be back in on this really quickly. I've changed the rig from what I was casting out there, basically because I think when the fish are in the edge, you know, having a pop up on is a little bit too blatant. The water's very clear here. I'm throwing in big bits of crumb, not little tiny bits of crumb, but bigger bits of crumb, boily halves, three quarters, quarters. I've got to chop down white wafter on which is a nice it's just slightly different color to what i'm feeding and um, that's got the butter corn goo sort of soaked into it and i've moved over to a cog lead so you're picking the lead up from the center of gravity so very very efficient hooker of fish i've still got the spinner rig on with a with a, a boom hook link probably about five inches long there's putty in the middle of that to hold everything flat down on the bottom no tubing because i'm just swinging it out and a couple of bits of putty on the line just to hold everything flat to the bottom. When the, when the fish are in close like this, they're very, very jumpy. And, um, you know, you want to pin everything to the bottom, um, use plenty of putty, um, and uh, think about your hook bait. You know, if it's too buoyant and it's wafting about too much, they can just leave it. We've seen that from the underwater films, but I've put a little bit of lead wire in it just to hold it a bit closer to the bottom trimmed it off so it looks like one of the chops, so it's not just a round boilie. Um, and uh, we're gonna stick with that. Hopefully, manage to get bait out without the swans coming in and, and seeing it being thrown out. So hopefully we'll leave the fish sort of uh, unbothered and we'll get a chance. Gotcha. Like he's nailed as well. Come on, get in that net. Get in that net. Boss got him. Yes, yeah, success. Just under 12 pound this one. Proper young fish, loads of growing in it. Great shape. 
and uh, again success on that rig so uh, we're going to put some more chops out put the rod back out again and see if we can snare one of them big ones because there are bigger fish milling about at the back of the area in particular i love big lakes and uh, this one at broom is uh, you know the perfect example of that you it just feels wilder you feel like you're more out you know in in nature and you know a big windswept pit big white horses running down the lake, you know, the big waves coming down, and you know, you're standing out in the water waiting to cast and getting blown all over the place. You know, I just love all that. Little lakes, you know, I, I, I do it, but I always feel like every time I tread on a twig or crunch on a bit of gravel, I'm just scaring them all away, and every miscast is pushing them up the other end. Small lake fish seem to be very, very moody and very aware of human activity, whereas on big lakes, you seem to be able to get away with more. And it's not like I have to fish out at long distance all the time, you know. Some of the spots here, I'm, I'm swinging it in, literally, you know, it's under the rod tip. And there, there's spots here that are 30 yards out, 70 yards out, 120 yards out. So a massive variance in the style of fishing that you're doing, which I really enjoy. I don't like that sort of one dimensional, I'm definitely gonna be doing this and, and that only. I've, you know, as my fishing's evolved, I've enjoyed that I can do loads of different kinds of fishing on the same lake. And uh, it, it always keeps you guessing. Oh, was that one? Yeah. Oh, that was one just off the back of the spots. Come on. Oh, that is gonna go, that left hand rod. Um, yeah, also on places like this, obviously, because it's not really been fished properly, it, you know, you, you never know what it's gonna be. And I've had all shapes and sizes of fish. It's great for the future of the fishery because, you know, you, you got fish from three pound up to 33 pounds. So you've got loads of different year classes. You know, maybe there's no 40 pounders in here at the moment, but for the future, this place is gonna do 40 and 50 pounders. And uh, to be around here at the start, you know, is pretty special. That show over the left-hand area was obviously at least one feeding fish getting on the bait and it wasn't long before that rod was away. Shows over baited spots on big open lakes are often a precursor to getting a bite. Come on, get in that net, get in that net. Bosh, got him. Come on. When you go onto a new water, mapping out the contours of all the swims is absolutely key. So you know exactly how many rod lengths it is to the bite spots. I write absolutely everything down. So if I come back on here six months later, I know exactly where to cast without having to put the marker float through the swim when the fish are about. And being able to cast the marker a long way is absolutely key. I see a lot of people with marker float setups, the rod's too soft, the reel's not very good, the marker braid's too thick, so it won't cast a long way, and it limits you so much. So my setup is really balanced, and it means I can cast the drop zone marker float 130, 140 yards into the wind. So first of all, the rod, it's a Longbow DF X45 spot and marker. That's coupled with a Bazier reel, which casts absolutely miles. It's loaded up with marker braid, which is super, super thin. And to take the force of the cast, I'm using a 50 pound armor cord leader. And being that little bit thicker as well, which stops the marker float from tangling in the air. There's nothing worse than finding a great spot. You try and let the float up and it's tangled and you have to start all over again. The shape of the float is also absolutely key and you'll notice the drop zone marker floats are actually fatter at the bottom than they are at the top and that makes them really, really stable in the air. They're also very, very buoyant. So when you cast a long way, it's still actually pulling that braid as you're taking it off the reel. The flight on the top's also key, very, very visible. You can take them off and change them for other colors. So if the light conditions change, you can always see the top of the float, but it's the visibility that really makes it stand out from other floats. Lead wise, I'd normally use probably a three ounce lead going up to a four or four and a half ounce lead if I'm casting into the wind long distances. And I'll swap between either a probe lead or the new marker leads with the prongs on. What I'm finding on this particular lake is there's very little clean bottom. So if you've got the marker lead with the prongs on, it's immediately locked up. When you wind in, there's loads of dead Canadian all around it. If you find a clear area and that one with the prongs on actually slides, you know it is super clear. And that's a brilliant place to mark down in your little log so that you know when you go back into that swim exactly where the clear spots are. If you're trying to bump the lead through weed, I'd go over to a probe lead. Again, it's uncoated, so you feel a lot as you drag it back, but you can actually bump 
dump it through the weed and it not get so caught up. So it's a case of changing the marker lead depending on the situation that you're faced with. And then baiting up wires, I've got a Longbow Infinity DF spod rod, which is even heavier, even more powerful than the spod and marker. That'll put a spom out as far as I can get a marker float. And that's coupled with an emblem spod reel, which is loaded with spod braid, which is just as thin as the marker braid. It's bright green in color, and that's basically so you can put it out, leave it on the surface, and if you've got seagulls diving on your area, you can sometimes put the spod out and then throw in stick over the top, and the actual brightness of it actually keeps the seagulls away. I use a 30 pound armor called leader in that situation, again tied with a four tone water nut, so it's a really, really small knot, and that together just flies off of that rod like I say, I can get it 130, 140 yards, even into the wind. So if you're looking to move on to a big water like broom, you know, you need to have a balanced setup so that you can map the swim and bait up at long distance. It was another gorgeous spring morning at Broom, and it looks set to be another scorcher of a day. So I baited the long area with a few more boilies because I expected the fish to start feeding again as the sun warmed the shallow water. It's also a good time to wind in one of the long rods and put it back on the short spot to the left as the fish here seem to be coming in closer during the day than they did at night. For the first time this spring I've started to get action on the long areas at night which says to me fish are responding more and more to the bait as the water temperature increases running up to spawning time. Night bites are a great indicator that you can use more bait in the warmer water. The fish here come in all shapes and sizes, just like this upper 20 ghosty mirror. I never get bored of catching such gorgeous fish. Mwah. Off you go. By mid-morning, the southeasterly had sprung up again and it looked absolutely smack on for more action. I'd worked out that by walking well left, I could steer the fish away from the other rods. It really is such a buzz when you start to suss out a new water and you just know it's gonna happen. Gotcha! This is a spinner rig, it's the one that's been catching all the fish for me on these particular sessions at Broome. And basically you can cast it onto any lake bed, it doesn't tangle and it's very, very aggressive at hooking the fish. As I'm moving around here, sometimes I'm casting into maybe three foot of water onto gravel and I'm moving to another swim and it's six foot deep and there's a bit of weed on the bottom. And this will basically present over all those different situations. So starting off with the hook link and the hook in particular, it's a size four curve, my favorite pattern, very sharp straight point, sweeping bend in turned eye and coupled with this rig it makes it turn over and catch hold really aggressively and the essence of the rig is the quick change ring swivel that it's attached to all I've done there is opened up that little crook on the ring swivel slid the hook on and then covered it up with a medium sized sinker and because that's got an in turned eye effect it makes the hook flip over and catch hold even quicker to stop the bait coming off the hook I've got one of the hook beads and then the bait is basically tied onto a micro ring swivel so like a size probably 25 swivel just pulls into there just neatly i use a bit of bait floss basically pull that through the bait and then tie a succession of overhand granny knots around the hair stop at the top and you can cast that miles and it won't come off and then going down the hook link it's basically crimped on this material is called boom because it creates a boom section it's fluorocarbon tinted so it's almost invisible in the water and then basically it's crimped at either end so the crimps are double barreled you go through one barrel round the ring swivel through the other barrel pull it up really tight into the jaws of the crimp tool and then just squeeze it down and that's it done and the secret of crimping is the material you put through the crimp must be as close to the size of the crimp as possible. So it should only just fit through. And these are 06 crimps and the material is 055 diameter. So it's the perfect fit for this situation. And then at the other end, again, it's crimped onto a size 11 ring swivel and that is sliding up and down the lead core. Now, before we go on to the lead system, how the pop-up sinks is really, really important to me. So you've got quite a lot of dark matter putty, mould it round that top crimp, and I want my pop-up sinking fast. And the reason for that is, one, I don't want them swaying around as the fish come in to feed. If the pop-up is very, very light, they can come up off the bottom and look really unnatural. So I want them pinned to the deck. 
And the other thing is, if it sinks really quickly, it's much more likely to find its way through the fronds of weed and down to the bottom, rather than getting hung up maybe three or four inches off the bottom and looking really out of place. So always overweight them with this rig. And then going on to the lead system, it's a very short lead core leader. This one's probably only about two and a half feet long. And at one end, I've got the helisafe system. That's really, really key in this situation. You've got big fish in really shallow water that are fighting absolutely like demons. You need to be dumping the lead. If the lead was staying on, especially when I'm fishing at long range, it creates a horrible angle, gets caught in the weed, and that can end up pulling the hook out. So the helisafe in this situation is, is fish to dump the lead. If there was no weed or snags or anything out there at all, then I would consider keeping it on. And there's a little collar to put into that to stop the whole thing compressing, and that keeps the lead on. But in this situation, when the fishing is tough and it really matters, it's worth dumping the lead. And lead size, I'm using anything between two and a half ounce. If I'm just dinking it in, flicking it out, maybe 20, 30 yards, the lightest lead I can get away with to minimise the disturbance. And then I'm just moving up to a heavier and heavier lead depending on how far I'm fishing. So when I'm fishing 70 yards, I've got a helicopter lead on there of three ounces. That's nice and flat on the bottom. So feeding the lead down is really, really key in my fishing. I need to know that there, maybe there's some weed out there or it's clear, but it's not too weedy. And with a lead like that, it just tells you that little bit more. If I'm going for real distance, then I'll go for a three and a half or maybe even a four ounce, and then sometimes move over to a distance lead because they cut through the air that bit better. So it makes it so easy to change because you just compress that heli safe, take the lead off and slide another one on. And then the other key aspects of this, up the lead core there's a no trace bead. So you've got a little tiny tapered collar and on that is a bead with a split in it. Basically what will happen if the fish is dragging the lead around, it will pop that bead off and it means the hook link can slide up off the top of the lead core and basically all the fish is left with is that little tiny hook link. And I think when the line goes slack, that's when the fish can get rid of the hook. So I don't know how they do it, but basically the hook will eventually find its way out and then the fish is completely free. So having a no-trace system like that for me is absolutely mandatory. You can use pretty much any pattern of hook with this rig, especially if it's got an interned eye. I like the wide gapes as well. They help fish in the pop-up really close to the lake bed. And in situations where there's a lot of food out there, the water's very shallow and there's not so much weed, that can be a real advantage. Lengthwise on the hook link, I like really short hook links. And you know, sometimes when I've been fishing here, I've been fishing three inch hook links and absolutely nailing the fish. In this particular session, I've dropped a couple of fish and I've lengthened the hook link and got better hook holds. So what you'll find is the way the fish are feeding, the weather conditions, how pressured they feel will all change the way they feed. And sometimes you have to muck about with the length of the hook link to suit that situation. So my advice is to keep loads of booms tied up and then you can swap from one to the other really, really easily. And once you've had a fish, you're basically sliding that kicker up out of the way, sliding the hook off, putting another one on. Sometimes I even reuse the same bait if it's not been out in the water too long and you are back fishing again. So it's something that really incorporates the quick change system, works brilliantly as a single or over bait, and you can cast it onto any lake bed. If you use heli safes a lot like I do, every now and again you will lose a lead when you shouldn't. And what's basically happened is grit's got inside it, it's held it open, so the gate is basically unlatched, and as you hit the clip, the lead just falls off. It's a very, very easy fix. Take the cap off of it, pull it apart, just give it a good blow, take all the little bits of grit off of it just with your fingers, put it back together again, and it'll work absolutely fine. And if, like me, you're using it with lead core, you'll find eventually the lead core will start to wear down as it exits the heli safe. Basically, take it apart, cut the little tiny swivel off the end, re-splice it back on again so you're onto a fresh bit of lead core, and it's perfect again for the next few months. Over there. Feels big. Completely different fight this is. There's a big ghosty common. Come on, get in that net. Get in that net. Bosh, got him! Yes! Come on! What a fish. I think it's a 40, you know. It's massive.
Yes! It is a 40 pounder. It's a good 40 as well. 43, 12. Amazing, amazing. What a lake. Check that out. What an amazing, amazing carp. Just totally and utterly blown away by this fish. And uh, this doesn't light your fire for fishing somewhere new, then nothing's going to. Just, uh, it's so, so interesting finding out about a new water and getting surprises like this along the way. Just, it's just the icing on the cake. If you're going to approach a new water, the first thing I would say is use your eyes to tell you where to fish. And I know that seems obvious, but so many people jump into a swim that's hot or one that someone's told them there's done fish before. You know, they're not looking for the fish. And uh, as a consequence, it makes the lake seem really difficult. If you get there early in the morning and you leave your gear in the car, you lap and lap and lap the lake until you find them showing. It makes a big lake like this seem so much smaller. And when you know you're not gonna get a bite, you know, 24 hours into the session, if you know it's not gonna happen, then you need to be on your toes again and you need to be moving. And the more you fish, the more you get that feeling, you just know it's not gonna happen. And if you feel that in your gut, you've gotta be off looking for the fish elsewhere. I really pay loads of attention to the weather as well. I've got the weather apps on my phone. I'm going through them all the time. If you look at the weather and it's turned around to a westerly or a southerly, it's gone low pressure, it's gonna be really mild. You know then the fish are gonna be more active. Maybe you take more bait with you, you know, or you stand at the end of the wind and look for fish showing in the wind, you know, because that's where there's gonna be more oxygen and the water's nice and warm. You know, all those things can really help you. And I, I look at the weather in between sessions as well, not just when I'm there. So you can see what's been happening in between. If there's been a really cold snap or something and not a lot's been out, then maybe the next time you go back, you just fish singles for a little while. You don't put any bait in because the fish have sort of been knocked back a little bit. So paying attention to the weather is absolutely key. The fish here are very affected by the wind. I've got the wind trickling in here now and it's no surprise that I've had loads of action in this swim. And uh, even when the wind is cold, I've noticed that the fish are moving on it. Not all lakes are the same, but that's something to record and basically keep in the memory banks. So when you come in here again the next spring, you know exactly what the fish are gonna be doing. And recording what you're finding out is so, so important. My phone is absolutely full with different files for different lakes of how many wraps it is to all the spots, what trees I'm casting at, when I've got the bites day or night, what it fish like in the spring, what it fish like in the summer, the autumn, the winter, everything's written down so I can refer back to it. And it's amazing how much you actually forget. And you read back and you think, oh right, that swim does really well in September, I'll keep an eye on that. And that information just takes you to another level and you can basically work out a lake much quicker by recording everything that's going on. Using the distance sticks is an absolutely essential part of my modern day fishing. I really don't know how I got by without them. And I know our ones are probably two and a half times as expensive as the average ones, but in my opinion, they're 10 times as good. And I was really concerned, you know, about the retail price of them when the product development guys told me. But having that Arga point so you can screw them into the ground with a T-bar, having the spirit level so you know you've got them perfectly straight, and also the grooves in them, which is Jim at Jag's idea to stop the too much line coming off, all of those features combined are just an absolute godsend and I could never see myself going back to the original type of distance stick. You'll see me wearing a cap and Polaroids for virtually all of my fishing, even on days like today when it's not sunny, your vision for a set of Polaroid sunglasses is so much better than standard vision. You can pick out the rig in the air better, but most importantly, you're gonna be spotting the fish better. And by wearing a peak cap, it takes the light out, just covers the glasses up that bit better. Sometimes you're better off to shield your eyes as well to stop the light coming in from the sides. And a decent pair of polarized sunglasses like these are absolutely essential for me. Spotting fish, especially on big lakes like this, is the absolute key to getting bites. I basically couldn't fish without them.
The thing that spurs me on to keep fishing hard all the time, bearing in mind I've been doing it over 30 years now, is the winning, the succeeding. And you can never guarantee what's going to be taking your hook bait. So the size of the fish for me is not really the, the primary consideration. It's getting it right on the day, working out what needs to be done in that particular session and being consistent session after session. That's really what pushes me to fish as hard as I can every single time I go. Thank you.